Detroit's new arena is taking shape. We'll talk with Tom Wilson about District Detroit. And the Flint water crisis goes to Washington. Today is Sunday, February 7th, 2016, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. Good to have you with us this morning. It was another busy week, which seems to be the only kind we have anymore. Several weeks ago on this program, I asked my guest Darnell Early if he felt he could continue as the emergency manager of Detroit Public Schools since it was becoming clear that his role as emergency manager of the city of Flint was going to be under a high-powered microscope as authorities unravel the water crisis. He believed he could. Well, this past week, he announced his resignation from DPS while he was hoping to avoid testifying about Flint, even under the weight of a subpoena. But where does it now leave Detroit schools? There's no shortage of critics of the school emergency manager system, but what are the options with furious teachers on one side and a governor trying to sell the legislature on his school's plan on the other? We're going to talk about that this morning. But up first, if some are worried that the problems in Flint are taking Southeast Michigan back to our Rust Belt reputation, one project in particular is still hoping to be the shining example of the new Detroit. What's happening on Woodward Avenue just north of I-75 is more than the construction of a hockey arena. It is far more ambitious than just a sports venue. The Illiches want a new place for the Red Wings to play, of course. But the plan is for a neighborhood, complete with a grocery and a hotel and retail and walkable spaces and workplaces. It is by any measure ambitious. And we'll talk about that first with Tom Wilson of Olympia Entertainment today on Flashpoint. We're going to get to the latest on Flint in a few minutes, but first, let's start with the extraordinary things taking shape in that area that will soon connect Midtown and Downtown Detroit. The Red Wings Arena is taking shape very quickly, and so is the plan for the areas around it. Let's peer into the future with the President and CEO of Olympia Entertainment. Very good to have Tom Wilson with me this morning. Tom, thanks very much for coming. Good to be here, This Doug. has been very exciting for those of us who work downtown to watch as it's taken shape, uh, really changes every day. But this already reminds me of that old children's story about the goldfish that keeps outgrowing its bowl. <laughs> this thing started as a $450 million project. We are now at about three times that. We're looking at $1.2 billion. How has it changed so quickly? What's going on? Well, I think the interesting thing is that's just the beginning. I mean, I think the, the ambition here is amazing. And we actually started and, and had a, an arena already conceived and drawn and, and, and put a lot of time into that. Right. But it was an 18-story arena, very much like the United Center in Chicago. And then the Illiches said, we can do so much more, and we can make so much more of an impact if we look at that whole surrounding area, which is 50 blocks, and commit ourselves to make the serious difference in downtown Detroit. And so as we started doing that, then the, the whole project changed. You changed the structure of the arena. You brought it down 40 feet into the ground so that it was scalable for this whole neighborhood. And now when you see the energy that we're seeing in terms of sweet sales and our, how excited our fans are and everything yeah, like that, yeah. and then you see other developers coming in saying, we want to be part of this. Very much like Brooklyn, which was down for a long time. Right, and then right. suddenly, d development by development, it started coming back. And that's what we're seeing. It's not just us. It's everybody else. The, the idea that it could somehow be a neighborhood, and you're looking at, at, at residential, in fact, some of that is set aside for people who don't have a lot of money. How reasonable is that? Is, is that a piece of it that is well intended that in the end won't quite work? Or do you see that? I, I, think, I think anything that we're talking about will really work. I mean, it's that old saying of what do you do when your reality exceeds your dreams. I, I think the biggest difference now is the momentum in downtown Detroit from every direction. And you know, for years, it was always like one person, whether it was Henry Ford II uh, doing the Rensen or Max Fisher doing great things, or even the Illiches building Comerica Park. And come on, everybody, let's do it together. Uh, but when you're doing it by yourself, it's difficult. And now you look in what Danny Gilbert's doing downtown yeah. and what General Motors is starting to do. And then in mid town you have DMC and you have Wayne State and so add that to a mayor who's determined to make this a better city and a vibrant city again it's hard to get something started by yourself when there's 12 people it's hard to stop it's a really important point you're making there used to be I think a sense of uh, at least rivalries if not outright jealousies over what anybody else was doing is there has there been a change in that or is it just a different kind of competitiveness well I don't I don't really see it as competitiveness as much as everything that 
Dan Gilbert does is good for our project. If he brings yeah. more people down here, if more companies come down here, it's more people to come to our arena or to, to more businesses to come down. This is truly, when this arena is built, going to be the epicenter of sports and entertainment in Michigan. So it's not just a hockey arena, which everybody wants to say, but you're going to see major concerts and international events. And we've already secured the NCAAs for 2018, the Horizon Basketball Tournament. There's yeah. a lot of great things going on. And this is the animation that you guys have uh, put together on this. And what we're seeing right here is a really important part of this. You don't expect this to only be a, a, a venue for the people who have tickets to go in. You want a lot going on for people who just want to come hang out and be around the, the thing. Well, that's exactly right. We've put a plaza right next to the arena, and that holds, a, it's about the size of Rockefeller Center, if you've ever been there in New York, mm -hmm. holds about 4,000 people with an enormous video board. So if you're coming down to the Red Wing game, but you don't have tickets, most of them will be televised out there. It'll be pregame tailgates for the Lions. It'll be pre-concert uh, pre concerts that we'll have out there in this area. The goal is to have 100, 150 different events even on the plaza that either complements something that's going on or it just may yeah. be freestanding, but it's more feet on the ground. The other thing about sports venues is they are often, uh, or even concert venues, they're often only valuable the day that there's an event going on. But creating a neighborhood and talking about things like a grocery store, uh, a hotel, uh, this, I guess, your outlook is that this is busy all the time. Well, and if it works uh, and it's going to work, then that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what you have is 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 people everywhere. And I think the momentum that the city is feeling right now, the excitement and energy that they're feeling, is almost unprecedented in the last 30 or 40 years. And that's why you're seeing literally 80 restaurants opened in the last three yeah, years. That's yeah. one every other week, and they all seem to be working because individual entrepreneurs now have the courage as they see what the Illiches are doing and what Danny's doing uh, to say. You you know, there's there's going to be this critical mass. There'll be a thousand events taking place every year in that district, Detroit, as we call it, and that's one, three, or five events every night. That means my restaurant can work. You've also wanted uh, to put a hotel down there. You've aimed very high. You want it to be a five-star hotel, which I guess it needs to be actually for uh, if you want players to stay there from other teams and things like that. Some would s would suspect that's a hard sell. Y you haven't found that. We had seven people that were making inquiries, seven, seven hotel chains that uh, you'd be very familiar with. Uh, we'll probably be making an announcement within a, a couple of months about who's going in there and try and open it simultaneous with the building or maybe a little bit yeah. after. But that's just one more piece. We have people that are coming in looking for office space. So it's residential, it's commercial, it's a little bit of everything, retail space. And the demand is incredible. Now, about 75% of this is coming from private money. Uh, in relative terms and projects we've seen in other cities, that's pretty high. However, you still must hear all the time from people going, look, these are millionaires and billionaires. Why do I have to subsidize this at all? And your answer to that is well, what? Sometimes that happens, but projects like this are, are most often, I mean, the vast majority are public-private partnerships. And normally the city, the county, the state sees value in what you're doing. And the value in this was made a lot of sense at 450 or 500 million. Now that we're at a billion, soon to be above that and above that and above that it's a it's a relatively small amount of money that's going into that project for what is going to be returned and it's the connective tissue between midtown and downtown that's going to be so exciting the other part of this though that I, and you've been around the sports world a lot you know that some fans feel like they are getting pushed farther and farther uh, to the margins while businesses and sweet owners and the priority has turned all this in and when you look at the, at the price of a ticket at the Super Bowl mm -hmm. which will be played later today it's insane how do you keep the average fan who has been such a big part of the Red Wing story forever, how do you keep them feeling very connected to what's going on? Well, one of the things you do, certainly, is as great as the, the Joe has been from a memory standpoint, there's not a whole lot of amenities there, uh, to be mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. And so you give them a great place to watch the game. And then you look at, at what's important to them. And one of the things we don't have at the Joe is, is a lot of seats in the lower level. So in this building, you'll come in on ground level. You'll walk down to roughly 10,000 seats in the lower bowl versus 6,000. So my connection to the game as an average fan is going to be even greater. Mm -hmm. I have leg room now. I'll have hip room. I'll I'll have the ability to go to uh, to the restroom. <laughs> I'll have ability to go to the concession stands with a wide variety. So my experience, which today consists of coming down at 
10 after 7, going to the game and getting out of there is going to dramatically change. So as an average fan, my experience is going to be better. As a suite holder, my experience is going to be better. As a partner, my experience is going to be better. Everybody wins. Don't feel like you have to bring those long bathroom lines from the Joe with you. I'm not sure anybody <laughs> missed that part. Uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you, you uh, are very familiar, obviously, with the Detroit Pistons. You know an awful lot about the Palace. There's been this talk of somehow bringing the Pistons downtown. Is that just talk, or do you think there really is a possibility here that the Pistons could somehow end up uh, a part of this or downtown somewhere else? Well, you'd never say never, and, and Tom, Tom Gores has mm -hmm. been very outspoken in terms yes, of his yes. interest in doing things, and he's already done some pretty amazing things with Pal and, say, Detroit mm -hmm. and things like that. So our job is to bring as many high-profile events, national, international, and local, as we possibly can to this venue. So we would welcome the Pistons for a game or five games or an entire season or, or decades, and they'd be a great addition to the building and a wonderful addition to the city. We'll see. Tom, thanks very much for your time, and we'll enjoy. I know we'll have you back soon as we go watch this, because unfortunately we can't open it until the 2017 season. It's still down the road, but it's going to be an exciting road to travel. It will. Thank, Thank you, Dan. When we come back, we'll bring in uh, the round table. We'll talk about uh, this past week uh, Flint and Detroit schools. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. The Superman. All right, let's discuss this busy week that was with this morning's roundtable. Good to have with me this morning columnist from the Detroit News, Bank Lay Thompson. Next to him, columnist from the Detroit Free Press, Brian Dickerson. Daryl Dossie is back with us, uh, formerly of uh, Deadline Detroit, as, as you were the last time you were here, but now communications director with the Michigan ACLU and syndicated political cartoonist uh, Henry Payne with us again as well. Daryl, let me start with you. Uh, in fact, we had your colleague, uh, Kurt Guyette, was here last week. The ACLU really helped start to tell this story. Mm -hmm. Have you got any idea? How the story ends. Where are we headed? Well, you know, the sad part is that for a lot of people on the ground in Flint, it will never end. It won't end until they're dead. Many people have been lead poisoned. There have been 9,000 children. All of the kids in Flint have been exposed to this. Many elderly people, adults, for 19 months. They've been drinking water that, you know, for uh, in some instances rises to toxic level, yeah. uh, toxic waste levels. So I think for a lot of those people, we need to keep in mind that there is no fixing this. Um, uh, uh, there is, you know, efforts to try and improve the, the, the water quality and the infrastructure there in Flint. Uh, but I think that it ends ultimately, hopefully, uh, with uh, us uh, uh, re uh, taking another examination of how we do, do democracy here in Michigan with the repeal of this emergency manager law. I hope that it comes with an overhaul of our FOIA laws so that we can ensure that our governor and our legislature and the, the, the emails that they write, the correspondence that they send, can be open to public scrutiny when we have instances like this so we'll know who's accountable. Hopefully it'll end with justice and accountability. Uh, Brian, he just gave us an octopus with many, many tentacles. <laughs> I mean, they're really, this does go off in so many different directions. Now you've got Capitol Hill starting to hold its hearings. It was hard to miss that it might be an election year in the way that some of the comments uh, were carried out. I, I would not look to Washington or Lansing and particularly the legislatures there to contribute much of value here. Mm. Um, they're so laden with, uh, with political ramifications for the witnesses, the questioners, uh, the, the stuff coming out of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party here is, is embarrassing. It, it's uh, like Kremlin-style propaganda. Um, there are some more serious investigations going on at virtually every level. I'm a little bit worried about them getting to the bottom of the truth either. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of prosecutors with subpoena power. They'll be able to put people under oath. But they also need to be able to offer people immunity from criminal prosecution. And it's not clear to me yeah. how with a state investigation going on, a federal investigation going on, anybody is going to be able to do that. So why is a $60,000 a year engineer going to say anything to anybody? And if there are criminal prosecutions, that, that would seem to suggest that there is that light under the door to do away with government immunity on the, all of these class action suits if there's criminality that you can prove somewhere. Um, Bankley, we, it was interesting. Uh, the governor was invited to testify this past week. 
Darnell Early uh, was invited, didn't show up, but subpoenaed. Uh, where, where, where do you think we're headed on everything? Well, the governor should should go before Congress and explain what happened. I mean, he admitted basically in his state of the state address uh, what the state failed to do. And you know what is more revealing, uh, uh, Devin? Here was when it was recently discovered, actually this week, that the state knew and they were sending bottles of water to their state employees, workers in Flint, while the residents of Flint were drinking Months toxic. Months before, you know, e yes. exactly. So I think the governor should should appear before Congress. I think Donald Ali should also appear before Congress. I mean, we can't have, you can't have the man who was appointed by the governor not have the one who appointed him. So both of them should be uh, in Congress. And if they're, if, if they're not, if they don't accept the invitations, Governor Snyder, like Donald Ali, should be subpoenaed. Should be subpoenaed. Absolutely. Uh, Henry, you've been supportive of Governor Snyder over his years as governor, but where would you, uh, how would, what kind of report card grade would you give him on handling this so far? Never mind uh, how it originally happened since then, since since it all came to light that there was lead in the water, how's he done? Well, I, I like that he has been transparent. We've, we've had so many promises of transparency from governor, from uh, at, from government at the state, uh, city, federal level. It's it's nice to see a politician actually show transparency, show all the emails. Uh, I, I think he's doing the right thing there. But uh, let me say this about the congressional hearings, because I, 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 to some degree, I am glad this is at a federal level. This, this is a, this is a real environmental crisis. This is the real deal. This, this is lead in water. This is affecting people, mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. You have a president. You, you and I like to talk about, but talk about this. But this is, this is a serious point. Um, you have a president who has made global warming his his environmental initiative for, this, for, for his second term. He's gone off to Paris with billionaires like Tom Steyer. He's talking about com committing $100 billion, $3 billion of our money already, to go overseas to combat this phantom threat. This is a real threat. This is where, think, this is where you put I think it's I'm sure hand. you've this got is, a bunch of people uh, here who agree with the word but, phantom. Go but ahead. We, but we, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go down, the, yeah, yeah. down, down that alley. I'll just, I, I just want to say this, this is a real threat. And what came out in that congressional hearing yesterday is that the EPA has been lax, not only in oversight in Flint, but also in Washington, D.C., and in communities in North Carolina. And this should focus people on what the real problems and threats to people are in this country. Devin, we broke this story at the ACLU of Michigan. Mm -hmm. yep. We talked to yep. Kurt. We know this story intimately. And let's be clear that you know this is not. We're not interested in you know trying to score cheap political points against the president. This is a result of policy right here in Michigan. Policy that this governor signed on to. The emergency management policy, which which eliminated checks and balances, which 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 made Darnell Early untouchable. Uh, uh, this is about transparency. This is about responsibility in government. The governor did release 250 pages of email, I believe, uh, some of which was redacted, uh, and much, most of which was about the period of time that we already know about. What happened in 2013? What happened in 2012? What were the conversations like mm -hmm. in 2011? If you're really interested in being open about this, if you're really interested in getting to the bottom of this and being accountable, release everything related to this. We uh, know that well, this yeah, governor I, can, I, talk like about, he can talk about bike patrols, uh, but I'd he like can't talk about what happened in Flint. I'd like to underline Darrell's point. There has been nothing like transparency so far here. There have been baby steps toward it. We don't have anything like a complete record of what happened. We're not going to, frankly, until people are subpoenaed and put under oath. And, and what happened, and what happened in, to Henry, you said there's an environmental issue. What happened here is a study for the need for environmental regulation. And what is more laughable is that you have an attorney general, uh, Bill Schuette, who announced an investigation when his record on environmental regulation is very poor. He fought against the EPA on power emissions of power plants. So you can't have people who are uh, uh, opposed ideologically opposed or politically opposed to ideas to regulate this environmental regulation. What Bank happened in Bank Flint Bank is a call Bank for Bank environmental Bank. regulation. That's what, that's what happened in Flint. All the environmental... So you can't blame all, it on the president. All the environmental regulations were already in place for this. The DEQ failed. The EPA failed. I mean, the, the, the answer here is well, not... That's, the that's, the that's the not true. The that's answer not here is, true. The answer here is not more government. The answer is government concentrating on what it's supposed to do. And in this Darryl case... What? They, they failed. Why is that That's not true? true because what, what happened was there was there was an interest on the part of appointees, people again who are not accountable to the system of checks and balances, which allowed them to game the system. We know from the research that we did, Kurt Guyette found out that they were gaming the system, Devin. They were actually they were they were actually gaming the results of the test. They were they were testing right. the water in but, such but, way. But, so but so but there the, is room for for for, for closure oh, loopholes. There because is the room but for because much the regulations that were in place, if they had actually followed what exactly, the regulations if they'd were, been, if they if they follow what was uh, in place and 
if there would have been stricter oversights of the people who were supposed yeah, to be so in the charge. My but point, this uh, is deregulation, environmental deregulation. I've only got a few seconds left in this, in this <laughs> segment, but as we make the turn here, we've now got Darnell Early out as, uh, or leaving as EM of DPS. How does the governor move forward on Detroit schools now? Well, the interesting thing is that people in both parties are conflating Detroit and Flint. People on the Democratic side are saying you have a failure of governance, of local governments, of local Democratic governance yeah. in, in two cities. People on the Democratic side are saying you have a, a neglect of, uh, by state and federal government of cities all across America. And they're all getting jumbled up t together right now. I, I got to take a quick break. The program commercial, not to be conflated. <laughs> we'll take a quick break and then we'll continue on Flashpoint on Local 4. All right, welcome back. Uh, yes, the conversation pretty much continued right through the break. Daryl, you wanted to say. Well, I just wanted to say when we talk about the jumbling of Republicans and Democrats, and it's not that I'm in the bag for the Democratic Party, but the fact is they were not in charge in Flint. Who was in charge was a man who was appointed by a Republican governor, uh, a, a, who, who was appointed under a law that was created by a Republican legislature and passed, even though the majority of the state of, uh, of, the, majority of the state of Michigan so voted, voted against like it, we didn't want it. Practice. So if the Republicans are going to sign on to this philosophy and this, these policies, they, if they're going to push these things, down our throat, then they have got to own the results. In this case, the results are all the children in Flint being exposed. Would you to allow, them. though, that it helped Detroit move through, come out of bankruptcy with breathtaking Well, speed. I, I would allow that it was what was in place, but I would also argue, I think there's an argument, argument to be made that Detroit did not need emergency management in order for Detroit to be able to do it. Mm, well, there's, there's a lot of debt there. Uh, <laughs> Look, but, uh, the, the reason you had Republicans in charge of Flint and Detroit is because the Democrats failed. The Democrats ran these cities into the ground. That's why you have emergency managers. So uh, not, not to let Snyder and Early, who, by the way, is a Democrat, off the hook. But if, if, these, if these cities were properly managed, they wouldn't be in EM hands to begin with. Uh, Bankley, make the turn for me back to schools here. What does the governor do? Well, you know, it'd be interesting to see who the governor appoints as transitional manager here. I think uh, the governor is in, a, is in a tight spot, obviously, because we are linking um, DPS and Flint. He should have fired, As he should Brian have let said. go Donnell Ali a long time ago, instead of waiting until it's late for him now to exit the stage. I think what he needs to do is uh, see how his proposal gets accepted in Lansing. Which is the, the tricky part. He's, he's got furious teachers on the one side and, and a lot of furious parents. We've got students protesting. On the other side, Brian, he's got to somehow sell a legislature to take on that debt. And, and the one thing I don't see is anything like the sense of urgency we're seeing toward Flint, toward Detroit, which is another man-made environmental disaster in which real children's lives are at risk. But, but my guess is what happens is uh, sometime around April when, when the Detroit public schools are very close to declaring bankruptcy, there is some short-term fix of that immediate problem. Well, here's here's the money left. Here's 20 seconds left. Brian, here's the, here's the good news. The good news is, is that parents in this city have choices now. I mean, Detroit is on the cutting edge of the charter school movement. And as a result, these parents who have been failed by the public by the public system now have choice in charter schools. So that's school. a good thing. All the evidence is the charter schools are failing the children. Absolutely. Too. And the I school has been a there. deficit since the state took it over. It's been the a deficit. Run the Meet the press next. Have a great week. We'll see you next time right back here on Flashpoint. <laughs>